Welcome back, everybody. It's the Uncensored CMO. Now, anyone who knows me well and has listened to this podcast will know how much I love a good challenger brand, which is why I am really excited in this episode to be joined by the founder of Liquid Death, Mike Cesario. Now, they took the very boring, very commoditized water market and completely turned on its head. They even called their water brand Liquid Death, which is the antithesis of obviously what water is. How did they do it? Why did they go to such extreme lengths to create the marketing they did? And how have they created such a successful brand that has taken on the giants of the beverage market? This is one of the most inspiring stories of a founder you're ever going to hear. And I'm talking to Mike, the founder, about how he did it and how he's created such a phenomenal brand that is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Here's my conversation with the founder himself, Mike Cesario. Mike, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Now, I one of the things I, I notice about uh, you and your brand is how similar they are. And I thought it'd be quite cool just for everyone listening and watching. Tell us a bit about your childhood growing up. What were you into and what's kind of shaped the kind of business owner you are today? Yeah, I mean, as a kid, some of the earliest memories I have were, you know, sitting on a skateboard in my older cousin's room, probably like maybe three, four years old. And this was mid 80s time period. So old school skateboarding was a thing. I also was really into drawing as a kid. Like even at five years old, I was always drawing stuff. So then when I started seeing the skateboard graphics of the eighties, I thought those were the coolest things. Got my first skateboard at the age of seven. And I remember I got to get it two months before my birthday because I won student of the month two months in a row. Um, And I got to go to the skate shop and with my dad and he let me pick out any board that I wanted. And I picked this Tony Hawk skateboard that's got this big claw behind the Hawk. For me, that was it. Like I was obsessed. Uh, I had Thrasher magazines, even at that age, I remember having stuff on my wall. There was like a thing of Tony Hawk that I pulled out of a magazine and it said in the caption, professional skateboarders can make upwards of a hundred thousand dollars a year. And when my parents would ask me, what do you want to do when you grow up? You know, I would say, my, my mom tells me, she said, you said, I, you want to draw skateboards. <laughs> that was that was what I wanted to be, not a firefighter or police officer. I, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to draw skateboards. So that kind of, I think, really shaped my view on the world of like eight, 1980s skate culture of skulls and, you know, cool stuff. And then um, my dad was a really funny guy, you know, rarely is serious about anything. So at our house at Christmas, you know, we're not watching a Christmas story. We're watching my cousin Vinny and, uh, you know, Rodney Dangerfield movies. So, you know, my dad was always cracking jokes. So there was always just the idea of jokes and humor growing up. So that kind of shaped me who I was, where it was this mix of sort of art and then funny. And then, My cousin Eric gave me his collection of Mad magazines when I was probably 10 years old. And that was like that perfect blend of art and fun and and, and humor. And, uh, you know, through high school and everything, I I was still always the, the kid that was good at drawing. But I was always drawing really funny stuff. Like I wasn't drawing these beautiful portraits. It was like I was drawing cartoon, weird, gross stuff that was more like Mad Magazine. And then, of course, I played in... um I started playing guitar and in about the seventh grade started, you know, that was the, in seventh grade, that was the year that Green Day Dookie album came out, which was that thing that just made punk this huge thing. I got hooked into that. And then I just started going down the punk rabbit hole of Bad Religion, No Effects, and and those kind of bands and just got super into this punk world where I was always kind of the you know, outcasty kind of kid, not so much, but like I wasn't the popular kid. And I think punk rock gave this cool and skateboarding kind of gave this cool lane and culture for me to kind of be a part of. Um, and I think that's what led to probably my entrepreneurialism is when we had a band in eighth grade and through high school, I was kind of the guy that was keeping the band together. Like I was designing the logo, coming up with the band name, silk screening the t-shirts, making the show flyers. Like you kind of build your own little business. I didn't think of it like that at the time, but in the punk world, this whole DIY thing was a big thing in, in punk rock. 
so yeah, that that was I think the the early beginnings that sort of shaped my skill set, passion, point of view on the world. And then yeah, ultimately when it came time, what are you going to go to college for? You know, graphic design seemed like the best option. Um, and then once I started that, I switched into advertising, which was more about making people laugh and conceptual thinking, not just making pretty typography, you know, 10 hours a day. Um, and then, yeah, that, that, that's how, what led me to the career. Amazing. It, it's, it, it really resonates with me, actually, because I, I, I grew up in the 80s as well, skate culture. I was down the skate park every single evening. And uh, like you say, the, the art on the boards were amazing. The music of that time was brilliant. And uh, I remember I th- read Thrasher, Transworld. We had, a, we had one in the UK called Rads, which is, you know, the kind of British equivalent of Thrasher. It was just an amazing scene, wasn't it? Like, say, like you say, all the rebel kids, that's where, that's where we were, hanging out down the skate park, and it's just brilliant. Um, same thing as you, actually. I did arts as well and uh, did all the flyers for my band and all the promo and like, the silk screen and the T-shirts with our faces on and all that kind of stuff. It's just so energizing. And what, what, I, what I love about your story is how you've taken your own passion and kind of made an amazing business out of it as well. We'll come on to talk about how that happened. Um, but in between time, I thought I'd also ask you about, uh, before we get on to Liquid Death Story, which is going to be amazing, you, you had a startup before as well in Brandy, didn't you? So tell us a bit about your, your, your previous uh, go at being an entrepreneur. I mean, I found myself, I was working in San Francisco for an ad agency, and um, I wasn't making anything remotely creative that I felt. Like my bar for what I wanted creativity to be was much higher. And, you know, the reality is most bad marketing is not because ad agencies aren't creative. It's because clients don't want creative work that pay the agency, right? So when I started realizing, well, it doesn't matter how creative I am. If we don't have the clients that want it, I'm never going to be making good creative work. So I sort of, by necessity, said, well, if I want to make real work out in the world, it's not just spec work. I've kind of got to create my own product to make interesting marketing for and at the time i was working on um virgin america the airline still weren't doing terribly interesting stuff i didn't think but i thought richard branson was really interesting and the whole virgin story and i read one of his books and i love the virgin strategy which was go into a stale category and be the one cool brand and without having to spend a ton you can kind of take all this market share and at the end of the day, almost end up changing the category because you are such a force of change in it that the other guys almost have to adapt. Um, so when it was time for me to make my own product, I started with that strategy. Okay, what would be a really stale category that I could maybe create the one cool brand in? And um, I, I was really into the whole alcohol space at the time. Like I was a big whiskey guy and tequila and mezcal. Like I love the spirits world and I was very connected in that world. So when you're starting something on your own, one of the, you know, best pieces of advice that I was given is your only chance is you have to be more of an expert than the average person. You have to kind of know it better, care about it more. So checked all the boxes for alcohol. So then I started, okay, which alcohol category is really stale? And really the only one I could really find was brandy. There was cool tequilas. There was a million cool vodkas, a million cool whiskeys, a million cool aperitifs, um, but there was no cool brandy. And I had never tried it. So then I went to the liquor store, you know, bought some different brandy, started tasting it. And I was really surprised how good it was. I was mm. like, this is a lot like whiskey. Very accessible, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I even had friends where I would do little blind taste tests. Here, taste this and taste this. Which one do you think is bourbon? People literally couldn't tell you which was bourbon and what was brandy. It, so it showed that brandy was something that it didn't have a uh, it didn't have a taste problem. It had a brand and perception problem. People just assumed brandy was like sweet liqueur, or they, they just assumed so much about it. So all of a sudden, brandy started to seem like the right thing to do. Came up with this concept um, called Western Grace, where it was, which was actually named after a song of a punk band that I loved called Hot Water Music from Florida. And um, yeah, it kind of had a very Americana whiskey vibe to it, which I thought would help people more accurately understand the taste profile. It's like they know what 
bourbon tastes like. So if you make this kind of look like bourbon, it might help people understand what it's supposed to be, even though it's brandy. And yeah, that was, you know, found a distillery that was willing to kind of produce the product or or had products sitting around that they could supply. You know, cold emailed some liquor industry people on on LinkedIn. They got excited. And yeah, we kind of went through a two-year process of sort of standing up a a, a liquor business. Um, and uh, yeah, that was my first real entrepreneurial. Now, what, what, what did that time teach you about being an entrepreneur? It taught me about being knowledgeable about the actual hurdles you're going to have, you know, liquor in the U S is the most insanely regulated thing ever. It's like, there's still laws hanging around from the prohibition era and every state is completely different. I feel like we spent more on just legal in the, in, in the beginning of, of Western grace than we did on actually making product, you know, with liquid death. So yeah, it was all these, you know, TTB approvals and liquor boards and, and all this stuff. So, and, and how you can market, like you can't actually market on social to people under 21. And it, it was just, it was really crazy. So definitely learning about, Hey, understand that the category you're in and, and what the, um, the limitations are going to be and, and how do you actually prepare for that? And I think it also taught me a lot about just actually starting a business, like who you partner with who you shouldn't partner with, how much you should give them to be your partner versus what's your role versus their role. Like having a very clear understanding of, Hey, this is how this is going to go. You know, like when I did the brandy, the two people I partnered with were much further ahead in their careers. I was young still. I was 28 years old, I think, or 29 years old at the time. Um, these guys were established, had other ventures, they could do this and not need to be paid. I had student loans, all of these things. And ultimately they were kind of able to squeeze me out where they're like, well, Hey, there's going to not going to be any money for salaries. And if you don't do this full time, you can't have the same amount as us where I'm like, well, I can't afford to be full time on something that doesn't pay me. I'm not in. So we, it, it created a lot of head butting and, and ultimately after two years of going and I realized that marketing wasn't really going to be a big part of it for a long time. And I just said, you know what, I'll take my little piece of equity that I have. Maybe one day it'll be worth something. You guys take it from here. You're the liquor industry experts. And then I'll go figure out my next thing. Now, talking about liquor industry experts, I've got a theory which brings us nicely on to, to liquid death is very often entrepreneurs don't come from the category they're innovating. Because the thing is, if because I spent 20 years in, in beverages in the UK, right, and working on some international brands. And if you had pitched the idea to me, I'd have gone, dude, that's insane. You know how hard it is to bottle in uh, spring water in a can? That doesn't exist. You know, water's a commodity. You know, you know the, the big uh, businesses like Coke and Pepsi have got the supply chain and the distribution sewn up. It's going to be really hard. You know what I mean? Um, to what extent do you think the fact that you weren't from the industry kind of almost was in a bit of an advantage for you as you kind of looked at it? Yeah, I, I think it's, you've seen, that there's plenty of examples in history where an outsider comes into something and has an outsized level of success that, than insiders. Because to your point, sometimes it's better to not know the rules than to just come into something thinking, well, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. And my question when people would tell me that would always be, well, why can't you do that? And there was never a good answer. Well, yeah, that's just not how it's done. There was people who said, oh, if you're launching a new beverage, you have to launch at least three to five SKUs. Mike, you're never going to get anywhere launching one. I'm like, well, why is that? Well, because you need brand blocking on the shelf. And it's like, well, when you have a really uninteresting brand, your only chance at attention is more physical space. But if you have an interesting brand, I can have one can of liquid death in a sea of plastic bottles, and that's going to garner more attention than anything else in there. So no, I actually don't need that. So I think, yeah, it's coming, coming in as an outsider, you get to, you're not bogged down by how things have been done. Now, granted, you need people who know the industry to help guide, Hey, where are the, the, the real minds and pitfalls and realities that, you know, have to be true. But 
if at the top the the vision is coming from somebody who doesn't come from there, I, th- I think it's yeah, a big that advantage. makes a lot of sense. Um, so tell me about the moment you came up with the idea. So wh- how did the idea come to you, and what was the circumstances around that happening? I was working for a small agency in uh, Tennessee called Humanot, and we started doing some of the first irreverent, funny marketing for the organic industry. And we had like a viral video or two. And that was sort of an aha moment for me as a guy that I did care about health. Like, you know, at that point, I probably hadn't drank a soda other than like once in a blue moon, you know, uh, I cared about health. Um, I was into being healthy. I didn't drink energy drinks, even though the culture where I was from was so owned by energy drinks, like skateboarding, punk rock music, all of that. Um, I wasn't drinking energy drinks. So for me, I saw white space in, um, why, you know, why aren't healthy brands marketed in the same fun way that unhealthy brands are marketed? Why is it that, you know, big companies invest billions of dollars to have people associate their products with fun, but healthy brands don't do that. It it doesn't make any sense. You know, it's not any more fun (laughs) to drink a can of, you know, Coke than it is to drink a can of water. Like there's, there's literally no more fun. But it's a marketing thing, right? And that's just how it's been done. This is this is how it's been done. So my idea started coming when I, I started thinking, because I knew after Western Grace that I was an entrepreneur at heart. In fact, the reason I took the job at Humanot, their original sort of ethos as an agency was they saw that when you take advertising people and you, at the very early stages of creating products and brands, it can be really powerful. Because typically what happens is business people, you know, with MBAs are the ones who want to create a company. They create the brand, they create the name and everything probably the wrong way. Maybe they, they hire a graphic designer. Oh, graphic designers, they come up with product names, right? It's like, yeah, but so they end up having this product that's not really that interesting or, or smartly branded. And then later in the game, when they have money, they hire marketing agencies to build campaigns around this uninteresting thing to make people care about the inter- this thing or somehow make it relevant when it's not on its own. But when you can have the advertising people at the beginning who understand culture and psychology and what people react to, to create the name, to create the packaging, you're starting at a way more powerful position than most beverages or, or, or any product typically is. So that was kind of their original ethos was, hey, yes, we're an agency and we have clients, but we also have aspirations to partner and help launch brands and create brands. So that really resonated with me. And I was always thinking about what my next venture was going to be. So then, yeah, once I sort of saw this white space and you know the light bulb went off for, oh, maybe the next thing I do is a healthy brand that is all about you know, brand, like you're going to win with brand. You're not going to win with some functional ingredient that you can't own that at a certain point when you're big enough, Coke or Pepsi or someone else will just produce the same thing, same ingredient, cheaper, more widely distributed, you lose. No, how do you, where can you win with brand? What are categories where the strongest brands win? And then that started kind of getting me, you know, more narrowed down to, we got to water. It's like, okay, water. There's really minimal, if any, functional differences between the brands. And we know that the reason, you know, Fiji or one of these brands or a top brand is not because of the taste. It is not because of the difference. It is purely because of the brand. People want to walk around with this thing instead of that thing. That's kind of how we got to to water. And then the, the more I started doing my homework, it was, oh, wow, well, water is a massive category. In the U.S., at that time, it had just passed carbonated soft drinks is the largest beverage category. I think it was 20, 20 billion a year at that point. So it just started again, checking all the boxes, huge category, not a lot of interesting brands. Brands determine kind of the winners where that's my specialty. I know how to do brand. So, um, that that's kind of how we got. Now, let's let's talk about the brand because yeah. I, 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 I think you've done an amazing job because you totally reframed what, 
a water brand can be, right? Because if you took your management consultants you talked about just before there, right? They'd come in and said, well, the ways to win in water are provenance. You need to get clarity, clear bottles, you know, purity, you know, they'd have come up with something like that, wouldn't they? They'd have been, these are the rules, you know, you literally ripped that up and went the complete opposite direction and even called your brand something that like on the face of it makes absolutely no sense. So, so, you know, explain to me how you come up with the name and what, why it's positioned so differently to water. Well, I think that, yeah, that's interesting. Um, that there's a guy, uh, that I met through one of our early investors. So my first agency that I worked at was called Crispin Porter and Bogusky in Colorado. Really disruptive, cool marketing run by this guy, Alex Bogusky. He was an um, early advisor for me in Liquid Death, had created tons of interesting businesses and was very successful. And a friend of his was this guy named John Bielenberg, who wrote this book called Think Wrong. I had not read the book when I met the guy, but when he saw Liquid Death, he really connected because it was kind of the, the, the epitome of what his book was about. And and I, and it, even though I never thought about it directly that way, when, when he explained to me what his uh, kind of point of view was, it made perfect sense, which was most people and just our brains in general are wired to replicate what has already worked in the past. It's like a survival mechanism. Like your brain is designed to find shortcuts. Like when you're driving, you're not really paying attention to every sign, everything. Your brain is kind of filling in gaps so you can autopilot. So when people start thinking of things, they go to, okay, what has worked in the past? What's working now? Let's make something like that. So most new things are really just copies of existing things. And if you really want to get to truly unique or innovating, innovative, you really have to trick your brain and try to think of a bad idea or a dumb idea. Then your brain is now tricked into thinking about things that don't exist because why would anyone do a bad idea? Why would anyone do a dumb idea? And then those ideas you get to start to be truly unique. Now, not all of them are good, but you'd be surprised that a, a larger percentage than you think are not dumb, actually. And when you really start breaking it down, you're like, actually, this might be genius. And I think that's how, that's probably, whether I realized the process or not, that's how I was thinking about a lot of marketing and branding and, of course, Liquid Death. You know, when you think about, hey, okay, I'm going to make a water brand. It's okay. What's the opposite of what the water industry is doing? What would what would that look like? Let's just go down that road for a minute. What's the opposite of it? Um, or what's the dumbest, worst name that anybody could imagine being on a water? Uh, I think that's how you start get getting to truly innovation innovative. Because again, someone says, I forget who who said this. Oh, I, I think it was um, Reed Hoffman. Yeah, he said that truly innovative ideas almost have to be laughable at first. Because if something makes a ton of sense the minute you tell it to someone, it means there's probably four other companies who have already been working on it for four years because it's too obvious. If, if, it's, if you instantly think it's smart, it's probably too obvious. It's the things that are like, you know, I always use the, the analogy of uh, Uber or Airbnb. It's like the minute someone had the idea of, I think people... Regular people should become taxi drivers with drunk, puking people in the back of their cars. No one is saying, oh, that's a brilliant idea. No, that's the worst idea. No one's going to do that. Or, oh, how about you rent out your house to perfect strangers when you're gone? That is the dumbest idea. No one is ever going to do that. And of course, they become some of the biggest businesses in the world. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's that's the way that we, we kind of got to so, so you've landed one of the best dumb ideas on the yeah. planet right yeah. this is yeah. great yeah. So, okay how did you sell that in at the beginning like we'll go back to the beginning when when you've come up with the idea you need to find production you need to get distribution you need to presume you need some investment i'm assuming you had to raise some money to kind of make this happen how did you sell the concept to the very early stages it, it was hard um that's why the way we launched the brand was creating basically creating a facebook page for the brand before it ever existed and then in tandem to that we had this fake facebook page making it seem real put a couple thousand dollars in paid media behind a couple fake social posts and a, and a funny video that we made for fifteen hundred dollars i was simultaneously 
going on LinkedIn looking for, you know, bottled water industry consultants. And I would get on the phone and just ask, hey, walk me through, like, if I want to put water in cans, how can I do it? And, you know, they would know, oh, well, there's only a couple co-packers. They can only do plastic. I don't know of any co-packers that can do cans. And I was just constantly digging, trying to, because, you know, I had done all the work of creating liquor, which was really hard too. So I've been in that zone before of like finding production, calling people, using consultants who know the co-packing world. Um, And then the Facebook page kept growing. We started getting, you know, you know, tens of thousands of followers. We had hundreds of comments of people that range from this is the greatest thing ever to is this real to this is the worst thing I've ever seen. There was a whole, I mean, we had 7-Eleven franchisees saying, hey, I own a couple stores in Michigan. How do I get this? Or, hey, we're a big non-alc distributor in New York. Can we talk to a salesperson? So we started getting some traction around an idea. And then I started getting more and more traction around the production side of it. And eventually was led to, there was nowhere in the U.S. that could produce it. So we found a place in Austria that could. And then we flew over there, met those guys. And then they're like, yeah, we can totally make this for you guys. And now all of a sudden we had a clear way to produce it. And we had costs and, you know, what we knew we needed to raise to to do a minimum run. We had a successful Facebook page that had more followers than Aquafina uh, at the time. And then when I had those two things, which was, you know, maybe a year into the initial concept of the idea, now an investor would actually take us seriously where they wouldn't before. Just an idea. And that's the biggest mistake I think entrepreneurs make. They think that ideas are worth something. Ideas are worth zero dollars. Everybody in the world has a great idea, but it's the people who can execute it the best that create value. You know, I, I, I see it all the time. Well, I had the idea to go to Mars. Well, you didn't build the rocket. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Elon Musk did, yeah. right? Like, yeah. it's, it's not your your idea. Yeah. So I think, yeah, once we proved we know how to execute at a really high level and we had a great operational plan, that's finally when investors are like, okay, I'm willing to kind of take a gamble yeah. uh, on this. Now, let's talk about execution because I've got a little bit of experience yeah. in the beverage market. And I, I know that uh, having commissioned a few cans in my time, like they don't start the machine for anything less than about 200,000 cans. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and yeah. that's per variant sort of thing. So how do you commit to the amount of minimum order quantity and you're producing a long way from home as well? So you've got to ship it all the way across the Atlantic yeah. and at a big, minim- a big cost. So how do you raise enough money to even do your first production? The very first round of funding that I raised was, you know, what they call a, a friends and family round, um, which we at that time determined for $150,000, we could produce a minimum run of product, get it in warehouses in the U.S., and basically launch on Amazon and our website. I was able to raise that through, you know, previous marketing executives that I had worked for in, for agencies that I still had great relationships with that, you know, they could write a check for five grand and it wasn't a big deal to them. My family didn't come from money. So it's not like, Oh, I just have someone that's going to give me 150 grand. I think my dad put in 20 grand, you know, and that was a lot for him, but I cobbled together all these five, 10, seven kind of checks to eventually get the 150. We then started, we put in the purchase order for the first round of, I think it was like 150,000 cans we were able to actually do. And then this whole Facebook thing for so long, people didn't believe it was real. Like it just seemed like this ridiculous thing that would never exist. And then once we got the first shipment of cans and it was a physical thing you could hold in your hand, I think it completely changed the way people thought about it. it, it, you know, so when an investor held the can, it was like, oh, wow, you guys actually made this. When we met the first institutional investor, which is this firm called Science Inc., which literally their offices are two blocks that way. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think they saw the potential really quickly because they were the big backer behind the brand Dollar Shave Club, if you remember that yeah, brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where that was kind of their sweet spot, which was find a brand that is trying to disrupt a large category through direct to consumer. That was that was kind of their thing. They saw what 
Dollar Shave did in the shaving razor business, which was this boring giant category. They were the one cool brand. They did a direct to consumer play. They were super successful. Liquid Death, same kind of initial strategy. Hey, really interesting brand, launch direct to consumer first. But we kind of knew from day one with Liquid Death for this thing to be successful, we have to eventually go into retail stores. Well, figure out distribution. Well, I was going to say, because uh, water's heavy, heavy. Uh, packaging costs are expensive, distribution costs are expensive, and retail price is relatively low, even though you're a premium, still relatively low. That's not a very profitable business model, is it? Like, you know, shipping it direct to people's homes. Right, exactly. And we knew that from the start. We knew what it was going to cost to ship. And, you know, that's why the original, the first cases of Liquid Death we were selling on, selling on the internet, they were 12 packs of 500 milliliter cans, and we had to sell them for $20 a case. And then we launched, when we finally launched it on Amazon and our website, it was late January, 2019. In the first month, we sold $100,000 worth of product. In one month? In one month. And we spent $2,500 on marketing. <laughs> no way. Yeah. That's so insane. We thought, you know, we were looking at these pallets of water that we just had shipped over from Europe. And we're literally like, how are we going to sell all this? And- by the end of February, we were sold out of product. That's insane. And then we basically- And was this coming, just, yeah. just, so, just, yeah. sorry, just to understand, is this yeah. coming from your Facebook profile, that demand? Or, or do you do anything else at the time to build awareness? Or yeah, how, how did that, where did that demand yeah, come we, from? Yeah, we, we took it like a legitimate D2C business. We had a you know, paid social strategy, which at that time, before all the IO, you know, Apple iOS privacy stuff, you could target people really efficiently, and we were able to get really good return on ad spend when someone's just seeing this can of liquid death in their feed. It's like, whoa, what is that? So yeah, we we had a um, you know we had a paid media strategy. You know, we had a pretty big list of people from the Facebook page. So when we announced on the Facebook page, hey, you can actually buy this right now on Amazon. There was a baked in audience. People were sharing that post. So there was a lot of organic virality that that was sort of happening. Yeah. Now, where did you go next? So you, you, you're direct to consumer at this point, unprofitable because it's it, very expensive to do that. When did you break into uh, retail and distribution? Our original plan for brick and mortar, because we knew, I mean, just a little bit of connectivity we maybe had with retailers or brokers was no retailer will ever put liquid death on the shelf in the US. I mean, you, you, most of the the headquarters of these major retailers, I mean, they're in the middle part of the country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's a different kind of mindset, very conservative. So we knew it was going to be a while before the retailers would see enough dollar signs to take a what they would think is a risk on it. So our original strategy was, okay, we can definitely get this in bars, like places where people are drinking, having a good time. We can sell in one by one. We look like beer. It's fun. There's a way that these bartenders, like they, they typically just give free water. They want to make money. So if there's a water that people actually see value in buying, because when people go to bars, they're trying to be social. They want to meet people. They want to, and walking around with a can of liquid death, people literally will talk to you. Even if you don't talk to them, you're walking around, someone will be like, liquid death, what's that? Is that some IPA? No, it's water. What do you mean it's water? Water. Let me see that. Like it literally creates a social interaction. That's what's that worth to somebody? So now all of a sudden we started selling into these bars and these bars who were like, guys, we've tried to sell bottled water in our bar. It doesn't work. Now all of a sudden they're like, we're moving through 10 cases a week of this stuff. Like, so we started having this on premise, as we call it, uh, strategy of like, let's just get into all the cool bars in LA. And then one of our first sales guys um, was based in Philadelphia, who was very connected in the bar industry in Philadelphia. He started getting us into like these bars in, in Philadelphia. And that was our strategy. Then that started shaping our distribution strategy. It's like, okay, now we need distributors because we can't just go hand deliver cases to all these bars. So it's like, okay, we have to go try to get on the beer trucks. Those are the guys that are going there. And then it turns out, you know, the beer industry in the US the big beer corporations like Anheuser-Busch, Molson Coors, because of the American liquor laws, they're only allowed to own 20% of their distribution network. So 80% of the Molson Coors network or 80% of the Anheuser-Busch network 
are independent family owned distributors. And they're allowed to carry any brands they want to carry. You don't have to be owned by Anheuser-Busch. Whereas Coke and Pepsi, they own their whole networks. You have to be owned by Coke or Pepsi to be in that network. So it enables us, again, to sell in one by one to these family-owned distributors and convince them that there's an opportunity for them to make money selling water to different bars and things like that. So that's how we started building our, our first distribution strategy through the beer network. And, and to this day, we still, we, our route to market is we use, you know, a ton of, you know, independent Anheuser-Busch distributors and, and big beer guys to, to, to distribute the product. That, that explains a, a, a big question I had actually, because having worked in the Pepsi system and, and particularly in the US, like direct to store means that so much of the store is literally owned, isn't it? By either Coke or Pepsi. And I get, you don't realize this as a consumer, do you walking into the store and you see what you think is this big choice. And then you find out that there's one or two companies literally own it. And uh, it's a bit similar in the UK as well. It's amazing. So much money goes into owning that kind of fixture. It's really hard to break through. So it's very clever kind of going in through an on-premise, isn't it? Distributor. I love that. It's very, very creative. Um, Sticking to the theme of kind of some of the constraints and challenges, um, you've been incredibly creative in your communication and building awareness of the brand. To what extent do you think the fact that you didn't have lots of money and you, I mean, obviously your advertising background really helps, but to what extent do you think the constraints that you had as a, as a founder with limited resources has forced you to be quite kind of creative in, in the kind of communication you put out there? Yeah, I think it's absolutely critical. And that's probably where a lot of startup brands get it wrong. You know, they have no resources, but they're trying to do the same things that Coke and Pepsi do. And it's like, if you try playing their game, you will lose. Like you have to invent a new game um, that either they can't play because, you know, the way they operate is very conservative and safe. They're not able to do these kinds of things. Um, But also marketing and brand, you can basically boil it down to it is an attention game. At the end of the day, that's what it is. You're a brand. You want to get attention to your brand. And there's a lot of ways to get attention. You can pay a lot of money for attention where you're paying, you know, it could be $60, $70 per every thousand people that just get exposed to something. That gets really expensive, right? That's why a Super Bowl spot in America is $6 million because you're reaching 100 million people with your with your ad. But most startup brands don't have $6 million to spend on running a 30-second ad one time. The only chance of survival that you have as a small brand with small budgets is you have to find ways to get attention for free. How do you get someone to want to share a photo of your product to their 300 social media followers for free? How do you get press to write articles to a couple hundred thousand people for free? How do you get people who have podcasts to invite you on for free to talk about your brand because it's that interesting? That is the way that a small brand has to survive because the number one reason, especially in beverage, that startups fail is they run out of money. They weren't smart with how they allocated their limited resources and they just burn through it before they ever get to that level of scale where it's sustainable. Because To your point, beverage is a really tough industry because the big guys own everything in a way that's unique from other industries. Like, to your point, the big guys own all the shelf space. They own exclusive deals with every stadium, every venue, every national restaurant chain, every ski resort, anywhere you go. It's casinos. There is exclusive Coke or Pepsi locked up deals where they are only allowed to carry those brands. They own the distribution network. They have people that are going into every retailer that you're in. There is enough Coke or Pepsi people to go in every single day and make sure that the product's on the shelf, that it's stocked and everything. So the reality is most beverage brands, if you try to take the approach of, I'm going to be profitable on day one, well, Unless you're selling something that's $8 a unit, (laughs) you have to price where Coke and Pepsi price. Because, hey, we're liquid death, we're water. In order to be profitable on day one, we need to sell a $9 can of water. Well, you're not going to move too many $9 can of waters next to $1.50 smart water or $1.50. So 
Coke and Pepsi, who own all the manufacturing, all the distribution, all the scale, they set the pricing at their scale. You have to come in at similar pricing and be able to grow enough and get enough customers that you eventually get to that level of scale where you're getting cans cheap enough. You're getting the right distribution. You're getting these things where now you actually start having the level of scale to start making a profit. And uh, yeah, and, and I think that's the way that, um, again, a lot of brands fail is you, you're kind of, like they said, the, the best analogy for a startup, you're jumping off a cliff and building a plane on the way down. And, and, and that's how most things, that, that's the, the, reason, the way to do it. Because yeah, you can go a really slow path. Hey, we're going to sell just a little bit and, and, and just eventually get there. But I think you mentioned something when we were talking earlier that the average time for success of a brand, of a brand is like seven years. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I actually, I actually looked into this when I, when I used to work in beverages myself and I was, I was running innovation for the Pepsi bottler in the UK and I looked at the best innovations over 10 years. I took a 10 year time period. I, I, I limited myself to only the top 20. So imagine all the ones that were below right, that. Right, right, I mean, right, there's, yeah. there's a ton of stuff. Yeah. I think there's a, a new brand launches every week or even every day in the UK, something crazy like that. So I only took the top 20. And um, there were some crazy stats, like 50% of them were smaller in year two than year one. They declined after the first year. 80% of them weren't there five years later, right? So so even taking the top 20, the chance of success was pretty small. And then when I looked at um, the, the, the sort of, I looked at the time series over time, well, actually what was quite interesting is uh, year one was no prediction for success. So what, what happened was, it's it really interesting this because the Coke and Pepsi system was so strong that they could launch something very average, but it would appear to be successful year one. The following year, they'd change their, they'd come up with something else, right? And then that would be out and there'd be new things. So you had this sort of like big launch, big decline, big launch, big decline. The, the actual innovators, I mean, Fever Tree would be a great example of it. They tended to seed the brand somewhere and like overinvest in a small part of the market and then build it out. Or Relentless was another one, an energy drink in the UK that did, did the same thing. But for those guys, it took seven years. Seven years was the average time before, not even like mega success, but before you were sustainable. Like kind of what you were saying in terms of before you had mainstream distribution, before your price, you know, before you could get economies of scale, before you'd even started having your own production facilities. Seven years. Like it's bonkers, you know? <laughs> it's like, and, and, and that is a, and if you have something really innovative, that strategy also comes with a lot of risk because if you are there, there's a there's a term it's more like the tech startup world but they call it escape velocity how do you invest so you get far enough where if someone's going to try to copy you or leapfrog you they're going to have to make a really big investment to do it but if you try to stay small too long and someone catches wind hey look this is working and oh we're just going to make something similar and for just almost no investment we can put it everywhere and you're nowhere and then you that's go it, bye-bye. That's it. Right. There, there, there's this, there, there was this, um, I can't remember what the phrase is now in the UK, but it's like a, there's a minimum rate of sales. So there's a minimum turnover per store. So if you're going to yeah. be in the fridge in the front of a grocery store, they've got maybe 80 like slots, let's call them, right? Um, there will be like, you have to sell 10 a day just to stay there. So if you're a new brand and you go straight into Tesco, the biggest retailer, unless you're doing 10 a day, you're out three months later, you're gone, right? So this is the conundrum, right? Because how do you build a brand that that, that is then sustainable once you get into distribution? So what you ha what happened is the ones that went early, went quick and went broad straight away, they ended up bit falling foul of these minimum kind of turnover rates because they were suddenly up against Coke and they couldn't compete. The ones that succeeded had to usually double down on a particular channel. They'd take, I don't know, garages or, you know, they'd take food service or something, right? And they absolutely owned it and they really invested in it to get to the scale, to build awareness, to build, you know, build some laws with customers. And then when they went into the, into the stores, they then had this kind of rate of sale that was sustainable. You know, that, that seemed to be the trick. So when I looked at the ones that after 10 years, after five and 10 years being successful, that, that, that te typically was the tactic they used. Yeah, and that's why I think D to C was so it's such a great strategy for new brands because with with the internet and digital, it's much easier to find 
your audience. Whereas a grocery store, it's kind of, you're just hoping that the right person wanders by this and, and, and buys it and you start finding your customers. Whereas if you can build a big customer base digitally through a lot more targeted marketing, through viral campaigns, through these things, you start finding your audience and it's almost always going to be more expensive to sell, especially beverages, to sell something digitally because, you know, you, you, you can't go too far underwater. You're going to have to charge more. So then what worked for us was, you know, we were selling $20 cases of liquid death successfully digitally. And then when we had our first retail partner, which in the U S was actually whole foods, they were the one national chain that said, Hey, we love your death to plastic mission. Um, you know, we're all about health, obviously. Um, and there's nothing else remotely like this in our stores. We're willing to take a risk and we want to put you full national right out of the gate. But at that point we had over a year of D to C audience buying from Amazon and our website at 20 bucks a case. So then when we got to announce now you can get it at whole foods and it's 1499, it was a great way to now drive people to a store versus having to order it and wait. And, and, and pay more money. So then to your point, when it came to rate of sale, we were doing really well out of the gate because we kind of already had a built-in audience that, yeah. that we were. That yeah. We now that, that's essential. You, ha you have to build it up. You know, yeah. If you're not Coke and Pepsi, you have to build up the audience and the distribution in tandem. Right. Otherwise, if one is bigger than the other, you just can, you know, it's going to, uh, it's going to be a struggle. I'd love to just touch on the Super Bowl. Like you mentioned the Super Bowl. You had a yeah. really cool uh, approach to Super Bowl last week. So tell yeah. me a bit about your, uh, your, your Super Bowl ad, shall we say, inverted commas. Obviously, Super Bowl commercials are very expensive. Six million dollars is a lot for for a lot of startups. Um, for a full national, there, there's other ways you can buy them that are more fractionalized and, and pay less. But um, you know, we considered you know maybe do it maybe we run one this year. But then ultimately, we said you know we don't really need one, and we could probably think of something that's really interesting that still gets a ton of buzz and almost you know hijacks the Super Bowl in a way, and that kind of feels very liquid death esque. So yeah, we, we came up with an idea, but we were like, we don't want to spend a lot of money. Like we want this to be what we call a small bet. Um, how do you spend a little bit of money on something that maybe it really takes off and is great, but if it does nothing, it's like, it's so small. It's not, no one cares. Right. So we came up with this idea that only cost us $10,000 to execute where we're like, Hey, everybody's talking when it comes to Super Bowl time, everyone's talking about every year how expensive they are. $6 million for a Super Bowl spot this year. Like, what are people going to do? It's like the most valued media placement in marketing. And then we had heard a stat that, and, and you know, I don't know if, don't, you know, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but what I remember the stat was something along the lines of just in Walmart in the U.S. nationally, every week, 100 million people walk through the stores of Walmart. Every week. Wow. A hundred million people watch the Super Bowl. And I remember thinking, that's crazy. Like the Super Bowl is every week in Walmart. That's pretty crazy. And that's just Walmart. Then what happens when you add in Target? What happens when you add in Kroger? What happens when you add in Albertsons? Retailers that we have full national placement in. So we did, you know, some research and some quick math and conservatively through our top retailers, every week about 200 million Americans walk through those doors. So we're like, that's kind of funny that when our stuff is on the shelf or on a display in the store, in theory, it could be exposed to twice as many people as the Super Bowl every week. So we said, now all of a sudden, the real estate on our packaging is very valuable. So we said, let's do a thing where we announce instead of running a Super Bowl commercial, we're going to sell an ad just as big on the side of our case. And we did a funny video kind of selling this, this, this potential media opportunity to brands. Hey, you can reach basically more people than the Super Bowl on the side of our case. And then we basically said, well, let's just auction it off to whoever the highest bidder is. And yeah, so we, we set up an eBay page. Um, and yeah, we, we had different brands and, you know, a lot of brands were reaching out to us directly because this is a real media buy. And that, but they were serious, like big brands were reaching out. Hey, we are very interested in this. We want to learn more detail. How does it work? 
what is it is, you know, before we start trying to figure out how to, how to bid on it. And yeah, it, it was uh, really successful. I think on Tuesday, we're going to announce like who the final Ooh, winner so you is. Did, is. Okay, so yeah. it's still under wraps. Yeah, it's actually... still under wraps for now, but yeah. Ooh. Any any clues as to how much it went for? Anything you can say? Yeah, I I, I can tell you how much it went for. Yeah. Uh, it's just over $500,000. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. Which, yeah. which presumably more than pays back all the production costs and effort you went to. All the production costs was $10,000. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, actually, sticking to this theme of getting customers to pay for your advertising, one of the things that I love that you do is the merchandise is just insane. I yeah. mean, like it's literally like going to the Metallica store or something and just going, I can get anything here. Um, and the thing that struck me about your merch is that like you're, you've got your, well, let's call them fans, shall we, rather than consumers, because I think that's a key differentiator with your brand. But you've got fans of yours advertising and they're paying for the privilege. Like, right. is that, so where did the whole merch thing come from? And is, is that part of your strategy to kind of uh, be worn by your customers? Yeah, we, with Liquid Death, we are in the unique position that we actually have fans, which are, is different than just having a user. Most beverage companies and CPG companies, they don't really have fans. They have people that use the product, but they don't really care so much about that brand versus another brand. Maybe it's price, maybe it's slightly taste, but there's not really a lot of very discernible differences. For us, because we're actually trying to build a legitimate brand through entertainment and making people have a reason to follow us or care about us beyond just the liquid itself, um, which means when they love our brand, they want to wear our T-shirt, just like bands and music artists Merchant apparel is a meaningful part of their business because people actually love entertainment and, you know, whether that's Metallica, you know, if you're a Metallica fan, yeah, you want to wear a Metallica shirt and let other people in the world know that you're a Metallica fan. We have a similar kind of audience where people who love Liquid Death, like they want to broadcast to other people that I like this brand. And I think what was interesting, um, and it actually came from my, my younger brother, AJ, um, he's like two years younger and you know, very different than me. He is not a punk rock or heavy metal guy at all. And um, when I asked him about wearing, because he wears Liquid Death merch like every day. And it's funny, he's like, when I wear Liquid Death merch, he's like, I'm not trying to communicate to people that I like heavy metal. He's like, I'm trying to communicate to people that I hate marketing. <laughs> because that's what Liquid Death stands for. It's like, yeah. we are making fun of the thing that 98% of people in the world hate, which is marketing. Marketing's terrible. And at the end of the day, that's what we're doing. We're making fun of all the terrible marketing and branding that's out there. You don't have to like skulls to like liquid death. You just have to like that our sarcastic approach is taking the piss out of marketing. And everybody, I don't care who you are, can get on board with that. And I, and I think that's um, that's a big part. That is a really good part. Because actually in all your videos, the parody element is yeah. just brilliant, isn't it? It's yeah. just taking the kind of tropes of advertising and just turning on his head. Right. Like like your uh, your innovation that you just launched as well, the electrolytes. Yeah. And there's blood pouring out of everyone and this yeah. sort of thing. But uh, yeah, so how how um, how important is innovation to the brand as well? So are you going to stick on water? You've just launched obviously electrolytes tablets to go in, in you know, in the products as well. What, what's your plan for innovation? Yeah, with Liquid Death, what we are building here is a healthy beverage platform. We're one of the only brands, I, I, I can't think of one other brand in history that is winning across multiple very different categories like premium source water, like mountain still water and sparkling, flavored sparkling water that's like healthy soda. We just launched iced tea last year that's very successful. And now we're launching, um, you know, hydration electrolyte powder packets all under the same brand name. Typically they create new brands for every category. There's not a single brand name that goes across categories. So that's, I think what we're really excited about that we, we have this unique power and we're, we're going to invest in it. And as long as something is healthy, it's premium and it's funny, it can probably make sense for Liquid Death to do and have it be pretty pretty successful. Yeah, uh, that, that's pretty cool. Um, 
I wanted to ask you about your plan for scaling and and, and maybe an exit one day as well, because obviously, you know, you're not making money yet. So how are you going to, well, what's your plan to kind of, I, I suppose, scale the business further and also, you know, turn in a profit? I mean, we're really just focused on building a big business with sound fundamentals. I think, you know, we were a venture-backed company for the early days, you know, super high growth. I mean, we were growing triple digits every single year. To be a successful company, you don't have to consistently grow tri- triple digits every year. Um, I mean, companies growing at 40% every year are, are insane, you know, especially as you, as you get to scale. So I think what we're really focused on now is, you know, shifting from sort of the typical beverage, like most beverage brands, startups, they operate in a sort of growth at all costs blueprint. It's like, hey, you got to price where Coke and Pepsi is. There's no way to make money pricing where Coke and Pepsi is. You're going to grow the brand, acquire tons of customers, build this brand. And then most brands will either flip it to one of the big guys like Coke or Pepsi or whatever. And then they're the brands that ultimately instantly bring it scale and, and profitability for the most part. You know, I think we're interested in a dual path, right? Like, and we want the optionality of maybe it is an acquisition or maybe it is a potential IPO and following the footsteps of someone like Monster uh, or Celsius um, and and being a public company. You know, we're not, we just want the optionality and we're going to do everything we need to do to give ourselves the optionality. But as long as we're just focused on continuing to build a great business and, and focus on profitable growth. Um, we're going to have a ton of options. Now, I must also ask you about some of your investors as well, because you've got a pretty cool set of investors behind you. Just just, just uh, explain who's uh, who's invested in the business. Yeah, I mean, we we definitely have a lot of the fun sort of celebrity type uh, investors. Like Tony Hawk was a uh, you know was an early investor in Liquid Death. Even you know we we uh, we had you know we did a a cool thing with Martha Stewart, who is now a, a shareholder in Liquid Death. So. I think we have a lot of interesting, uh, a lot of interesting people on the cap table. Live Nation uh, is an yeah. investor in, in yeah. Liquid Death. Uh, they've been a great partner for us, um, and they recently just turned us on uh, for Live Nation in uh, in the UK. Yeah, um, we're the title sponsor of the Download Music Festival there now, um, and getting really great responses. So, um, yeah, we we have a really interesting cap table, and I think because the brand had so much growth. And what every time we went to raise capital, you know, we had way more interest than we were willing to take on, which gave us the luxury of being really selective about who we brought in. Like we want people that understood the brand, what we were trying to do, what the vision was. I think there's a lot of startups that don't have that luxury where they end up with just really awful investors on their cap table that sometimes can can be the reason that the business is don't succeed. Yeah. Um, so I think we've been. Really That's really good advice. Now, now you, you've built a phenomenal brand. Uh, how do you maintain that kind of challenger spirit? That I mean, you don't seem to be giving up on it at all. But uh, how do you maintain that as you get to scale? As you're in different markets and you've got more distributors coming on, you got more people in your team. How do you keep that kind of spirit alive? Well, you have to build a team that's designed to do it. Really, what we're doing is we are a beverage company that is building outsized brand loyalty through entertainment. And that's not a new model. Red Bull did that. Monster did that. Now, their specific kind of entertainment is action sports. I think there's way more entertainment in the world than just action sports. Our entertainment is comedy. We we are the best at making people laugh. We invest in comedians the way that maybe Red Bull invests in athletes. Um, you know, we've got people who are in investors and ambassadors like Burt Kreischer, Tom Segura, Whitney Cummings, Pete Lee. We just focus on making entertainment. And, and entertainment is hard. Like you ask the average person, could you come up with a great idea for a commercial? Most people will say, yeah, I think I could. Because the bar is so low. But you ask someone, could you write a hit stand-up comedy special that could be performed on Netflix, they'd be like, no way. What are you talking about? That's like for professionals. So when you really take entertainment seriously as entertainment and know that the bar isn't other commercials, the bar is Netflix comedy specials, actual films, television shows. That's the bar. And you start looking at, oh, Liquid Death is so edgy. 
well, compared to real entertainment, we are tame. Yeah. <laughs> we are very tame. Like, look at what the biggest comedy special is and what jokes they make. Look at the most popular, highest grossing comedy movies, what happens in there. So I think as long as we are always focused on the entertainment side and taking it seriously, we have to build a team that can legitimately create entertainment. So on our marketing team, we don't have a lot of very typical marketing people. We have people that were comedy TV show creators that had successful runs of TV shows that are now a creative director. We've got comedians that are in our network that we reach out to for ideas, for flavor names or commercials or things. Like you kind of got to bring professional, funny people into your circle. You can't rely on marketing agencies or traditional marketing people to do that. Well, one of the things, that, one of the genius things that you've done is like, you know, people would look and go, you can't possibly call a brand that. You can't possibly be that extreme in your videos. But as we were talking about earlier, what are people watching on Netflix? What are they, you know, what, what kind of entertainment, you know, are they watching? And it is horror, it is comedy, it is, you know, these are things that kind of excite people, entertain people. And you've tapped into that, which is hugely mainstream. You know, people might go, you know, Mike, dude, that's, that's very niche. You're going after this kind of very niche audience, but actually you're tapping into a very mainstream entertainment uh, property, aren't you? Yeah. I mean, I think the last uh, Jordan Peele horror movie uh, called Nope at the box office outperformed like a Disney movie. Yeah. Like that's major yeah. big business stuff there. And that's a horror movie about death, blood, murder, yeah. you know, and even it was kind of funny in some parts yeah. too, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I think, CPG or beverage it, as an industry, it just is kind of in its own little bubble in a way compared to other industries out there. Like when you look at the video game industry, look at the entertainment industry, even you look at the fashion industry, like Nike, they don't run commercials that say our materials last 47 days longer than Adidas. You know, they're not functional. It's emotional. It's like Believe in the brand for a reason that transcends functional benefits. In fact, that's how I define what brand is. Brand transcends functional benefits. If your brand is functional benefits, you don't have a brand because you can't own functional benefits. You know, that's why, again, the rational business minded folks, early days of liquid death were like, oh, it's in cans. You need to make all your marketing around how aluminum is infinitely recyclable because that's your differentiator. I can't own aluminum cans. So the minute Coke or someone else makes a can water, I spent all my marketing dollars to tell people why their product is great too. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Now let, let's finish up with a question. Uh, so if you were to, let's say someone's listening or watching now and they've got this idea. You, you started out this conversation by saying anyone can have an idea. An idea is worth nothing. It's all in execution. It's so true. So what would be your one bit of advice to somebody that's got the idea? They're, they're sat there with the liquid death of tomorrow, right? What do you tell them now? I think the number one thing is be incredibly honest about what you are better than anyone else in the world at and what you are not. And that's going to help you figure out who you need to execute. Because I think a lot of founders, they, they want to do everything. Yeah, you know, I'm a marketing guy, but I, I'm going to be in the weeds of operations and I'm going to be in the weeds of this where you don't really add value. And yes, you're going to have to bring on smart people. Smart people are not cheap. You're going to have to give them a piece of the company. You're going to have to be okay with a smaller piece. But at the end of the day, would you rather own 10% of a company worth $4 billion or 80% of a company worth $500? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, don't get hung up on ownership and that kind of thing. It's like, be really honest about you need in every department, people who are the best in the world or one of the best in the world at what they do, whether that's marketing, whether that is operations, whether that's finance. And there is nobody in the world who is the best in the world at all three of those things. It doesn't exist. So I think that's the number one thing is figure out who you need to actually turn this into reality because that's the hard part. Idea part's easy. Turning it into reality, like that's that's the hard part. Mike, that is incredible advice. 
thank you so much. I, I thoroughly love this. It's been uh, been so much fun to do it. And congratulations on enormous success and long may it continue. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. Fun. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Thank you very much for listening or watching Uncensored CMO. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please do hit the subscribe button wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching, hit subscribe there as well. I'd also love to get a review. Reviews make a big difference on other people discovering the show. So please do leave a review wherever you get your podcast. If you want to contact me, you can do. I'm over on X at Uncensored CMO or on LinkedIn where I'm under my own name, John Evans. Thanks for listening and watching. I'll see you next time.